Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of To Whom It May Concern. I'm your host, Malak, here with my co-hosts, Mariam and Inara. Hey, hey. Salaam alaikum. So, unfortunately, this week, Khuela is not on our show because she is busy saving lives. But instead, we brought a special guest for today's episode. Our guest today was born in Jerusalem, Palestine, and raised in the south suburbs of Chicago. He graduated with his bachelor's from DePaul and completed his JD from the Michigan State College of Law and opened his own firm straight out of law school called Ramadan and Associates. He has been named one of the top 40 under 40 attorneys in Illinois by the National Trial Attorneys Association. He's actually also recently started his own podcast called In the Moment to explain how law and all its working to the common man. Without further ado, today's special guest is none other than Muhammad Ramadan. Thank you, hey, Muhammad. <laughs> pleasure to have you on. Thank you guys for having me. Yes, we're so excited to have you, and welcome to the Modern Skeptics. Um, so we're really excited because it's not often that you see Muslims, let alone well, Arab, let alone Muslims, that are having a really big impact. Or at least you don't really hear it positively. You don't hear the positive impacts that Muslims are having. And coming off of our episode last week on actually boycotting France and the really negative image they try to portray Muslims as in the media, it was so exciting to kind of read your story and hear how you you got awarded. I mean, top 40 under 40 in Chicago. That's amazing. Um, so we're just kind of really excited to just dive into conversation to first learn about what made you want to do law, what really got you excited to, you know, kind of explore the field of law and really get into it? Yeah, you know, for me, it was it was very, uh, not sound cliche, but very organic. Um, you know, I wasn't the type that grew up wanting to be an attorney. Uh, you know, we grew up in, in, you know, the south side of Chicago, first generation. Um, ironically enough to all the misconceptions of Muslims, all my sisters are actually educated. None of the men in my family were educated. Um, uh, mm-hmm. so, you know, kind of growing up and we moved around a lot. So, you know, we started at Marquette Park and we just followed the, the trends position like everyone else and, and moved on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I finally, I, I barely graduated high school and I went to uh, Moraine Valley, which is the typical Arab move. We all will go to Moraine Valley at some point in our career. Um, even when I got there, I, I didn't really take it seriously. I was doing, and I always laugh when I tell this story, but I was kind of following the trend of getting the uh, financial aid check. And then, you know, I kind of stopped going back <laughs> after that. That was kind of the thing back in the day. So, uh, you know, I was at Marine for almost two years. Um, I had a really crappy GPA. I had like a 1.7 GPA. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I had a terrible GPA. And, you know, it was just a bunch of kind of things that happened at once. Um Part of it, I I took one class, it was international relations. It was like five of us in the class. I just absolutely loved it. It I I got an A, it was the first A I ever got. I was (laughs) really excited about that. And, you know, I I, I was getting to kind of, you know, the fork in the road, right? And Mm -hmm. I always said to myself, uh, I wanted to do something different. And growing up, it was always, you know, finish school, don't worry about it, go open a mahal and make Mm -hmm. a little living and, and move on. And you know, that just wasn't me. And I knew I wanted to be something different. And a big part of it for me was I really wanted to break that chain. I wanted to show people that we grew up mm-hmm. with, you know, we didn't grow up with doctors, lawyers, accountants, and all of that. I mean, that's just, it wasn't around. We, we had no concept mm-hmm. of that. So, you know, I kind of got to that point and I, uh, subhanAllah, how just things happen. I applied to DePaul as a joke because I had such a low GPA my friend was going to apply. She's like, hey, why don't you come apply with me? I'm like, dude, nobody's going to take me. I got a 1.7. <laughs> so I, I didn't want to go to UIC because uh, it felt like there was Marine Valley, you know, part two. So I said, I need, if I was going to have any type of success, I kind of need to get out of my own element, get out of the, the, the typical arena that I was in. So I don't know what made me apply to DePaul. I, you know, I applied and until today, I don't know how, why God looked <laughs> over me and I got accepted. And DePaul was my, my, my turning point. Um, that's where, you know, it was really tough at first. I had no idea what I was doing there. I, I didn't feel like I belonged there. I, I, these kids were smart, you know, I, and I got there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, funny story is it was, I, I didn't even know how to register for classes, right? So I didn't know what 200 level, 300 level meant. So I'm going through, you know, I picked political science uh, because of international relations class. I really liked that. So I said, you know, I'll do political science. So I was applying for classes and I seen Mideast politics. I'm like, oh, it's my people. Of course I know this <laughs> stuff, right? 
<laughs> well, it was a 300 level uh, mid East class, and I had no idea what 300 level meant, right? I, I, I didn't even look at the numbers. I'm just like, what's 300 level? Like, you know, maybe that's just <laughs> the ball. And I got in there, and like, these white kids are like blowing me out of the water. I'm like, damn, I, I've been taught like fables and <laughs> stories of, you know, out of history. When in reality, that's not what it is. And I was like so deterred. I'm like, I don't even know my people's history. How am I going to, you know, survive this? But mm -hmm. I had some great mentors that I'm still close with till today. Uh, they basically kind of took me in and they just really kind of, um, you know, steered me in the right direction. So mm -hmm. I did great at DePaul, alhamdulillah. So um, I, I, I got like a 3.75 at DePaul. So I kind of balanced out my... Um, my GPA, but a lot of it was, I got to a point where I said, look, if I'm going to go to school and spend all this money, this is going to sound really dumb, but I said, I'm either going to be a doctor or a lawyer. I'm not smart enough to be a doctor. I know how to talk. I've always been in sales. So I said, you know what? I think I can help people um, that kind of grew up like I did and kind of be that voice for those that didn't or will never have that voice. So mm -hmm. I felt like law was the arena that would allow me to be me and use the skills that I had. And I just kind of picked law school from there. You have okay, a very cool. unconventional road to law mm -hmm. school. <laughs> totally, totally unconventional. Uh, and that, and I, did that that I applied to 11 law schools. All of them denied me, every single one of them. Uh, oh, wow. And then the last one was Michigan State. And they came and said, look, it, it was a very patronizing, condescending kind of thing, but I didn't care at the time. But it was like, hey, come to East Lansing prior to law school. If we think you're smart enough, we'll allow you into Michigan State, which, again, it was my only shot. Um, I said, whatever, I'll take it. The problem was DePaul's on a quarter system, not a semester system. So I still had five mm -hmm. left at DePaul when I had to go to Michigan State. So luckily I, I built enough rapport with my professors. They knew kind of how hard I worked. You know, I was working uh, two jobs full time, going to school at DePaul full time. So I would go to DePaul Tuesday and Thursday from 9.30 to 10, and then I would work five days a week. So they kind of saw that I was putting in the work. So they basically put me on a little plan of do this, and then when you get there, do this, and just turn it in when you're done. The second hardest part was telling my mom, you can't come to my graduation in Zagreb because I'm the first male in the family to <laughs> college. So, I, um, I had to kind of break that to her. But, you know, um, one of my favorite things she ever said to me was, you know, I, I've seen how hard you are. Basically, how go do what you got to do. I was like, that's when you graduate law school. Once I got the uh -huh. okay from Yamma, packed my car and went, did what I had to do, got in, and the rest was history. That's a really inspiring story because I feel like a lot of people don't know that there are so many law schools around the nation that just to apply to everyone. They think if they don't start off with like a 4.0 at the bat and have like the per, a 180 on the LSAT that they're not going to go anywhere, or they're not going to get into anything. And that's not the case. And I feel like it's stopping a lot of our people from going into the field of law. Yeah, I had a, my LSAT score was a 150. My GPA was maybe a 3.4, 3.45, something like that. Um, you know, I've been in practice 10 years. I've had two people in my entire career ask me what law school I've gone to. Um, and they were just, it was just casual conversation. It wasn't like they were judging my work based on where I went to law school. So I tell people just get in. Okay. Get in, get the degree, get the license. And from there it's on your hustle. I mean, at, the, at that point, mm -hmm. you know, you're on the same level as, you know, Jose Baez and Dan Webb, all the top greatest attorneys in the world. You got the same license that they do, okay? So at that point, it becomes on you and your hustle. So just get in, do what you got to do, get that uh, degree, get that license, and then from there, the sky's the limit. It's all going to be on you at, the, at that point. That's such good advice because um, people have a misconception that if you're not in the top 14 law school, then your law degree means nothing. Yeah, that's that's total, total BS. Um, yeah. I know some of the top attorneys in Chicago – they went to good law schools, but I'll tell you this. I practice in 26 in California. I've practiced in Bridgeview. I've done murder trials. I've done attempted murders. Um, I've never seen a Harvard grad in a criminal courtroom. Okay. You know, you want to be a Supreme court justice, go to Harvard. All right. You know, you want to be a <laughs> court, go to Harvard. All right. You know, you want to go work for some think tank in DC, go to Stanford, go to Georgetown. But outside of that, it doesn't mean a damn thing. Mm 
that's good to know. Um, Muhammad, what's your field of law? Like, what do you practice primarily in? So I started off in criminal defense. I was doing criminal defense, like hardcore mm -hmm. criminal defense for about five years, five, six years. Um, and I'm talking, you know, hardcore. I was doing guns, drugs, the whole shebang. Uh, but, you know, I was getting worn out. Um, and then I had my, my, my first daughter at the time. And I was kind of getting to the point where you know, I was getting really drained. I was getting kind of emotionally drained. I was getting, getting really just kind of... Um, you know, it's hard to explain, but I, it was just really taking the passion out of it. And mm -hmm. I always said, I, I, I never wanted to be that dead. You know, I was always worried about oh. being dead. That's always mm -hmm. working. You know, when you litigate, you know, and you want to do well in it. And I'm kind of, I, I overcompensate for my lack of, let's say, you know, smarts or whatever with my hard work, right? Mm -hmm. Hard work is what got me to this point. It was I was never the top of the class. So my motto was, I'll never be the, the smartest person in the room, but I will outwork any person in that room. Uh, mm -hmm. So, and that's for better or worse. So I kind of transitioned um, into the business world. I always loved the business stuff. I just didn't have enough business in my law practice for that. So I'm now over the last four or five years, I transitioned. I, I haven't done criminal cases in probably three years now. So I predominantly now do business transactional work. So I represent mm -hmm. A lot of businesses, um, either in Chicago, uh, so Chicago is trying to take their business license. Um, I defend them in the city. Um, I represent other global businesses that, um, you know, some are multi-million dollar companies, some are smaller companies. And then the second half is we do injury law. So we do a lot of personal injury stuff, car accidents, slip and falls, uh, those kind of things. So our, I, my office only handles two areas of law, which is the business side um, and the personal injury side. Mm, cool. Did you um, find those criminal? Sorry, no. Go ahead. Buddy. Criminal cases, um, extremely saturated, because I feel like everybody complains that one criminal defense attorney will get thousands of cases a year. Like it'll be so saturated, and you feel drained at the end of it. No, um, it, it's a very competitive industry. Um, so you know, you could <laughs> look you can never have enough business. All right. So, you know, that, that's never really been an issue for me. Um, it was the day to day grind, right? It was, you know, some days I would have to go to four courthouses uh, in the morning and you're jumping around from 26th street and then you got to go to Bridgeview and then you got to go to the branch court. Um, and, you know, I, I just, um, the system really drained me, right? It's, it's not fair. Um, you know, I, I've seen so many minority clients that would have the same charges but get a different result or a different offer than everyone else. I've been, I, I've twice, I've been, uh, the sheriff thought I was the defendant in court, okay, in a suit and tie, all right, uh, with a briefcase. Uh, we, of course, I didn't take kindly to him. We had an exchange of words, I'll just say that. Um, and I had to put him in his place. Um, you know, I know women uh, who have been women attorneys, criminal attorneys who will do circles around me in court. They're just that good being told by the judge that the help cannot step up to the bench. Uh, I've had, you know, women uh, attorneys being told by other you know, prosecutors, you know, where is your attorney? Uh, the paralegal cannot talk on behalf of the client. Just it really wore on me and I just kind of got tired of it and, and I enjoyed the fight. Um, I love fighting for people and I still do. Uh, but the business stuff is just a lot more positive for me, right? Like yeah. when you help someone open up their business, that's going to feed their three kids. It's an amazing feeling compared to some guy you beat his gun case. Well, he's probably going to call you in another six months because he's a street guy who's probably selling drugs. It's going to probably get caught with something else. Right? So it wasn't too many success stories and the mm -hmm. fact and the lack of success stories for me, really kind of started to uh, wear on me. I wanted more success stories. I wanted to be happy. So yeah. I started chasing happiness more than money. And subhanAllah, I got both. So um, chase happiness, trust me. Yeah. It's beautiful <laughs> in the area of law that it's different than medicine. So like medicine, you can't just shift around whatever you want. You have to like specialize and do a fellowship in a certain type of medicine. But lawyers, we could do criminal law one year, the next year business law, the next year patent law. Like we're not just stuck in like a specific hole. We can just move around as we please. Correct. You can shift. You know, uh, I have so many friends that will tell you, 
I would have never thought I'd be practicing this area of law when I was in law school or when I was an undergrad. You know, sometimes you just fall into things. And, you know, that's why I tell, uh, you know, I mentor a lot of law students and I always tell them, don't be rigid. You don't know what's going to come to you. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought I was going to do immigration law. I actually did my externship in Washington, D.C. in law school mm -hmm. thinking I was going to do immigration law. And then I came out and I absolutely hated immigration law. Um, so I said, there's no way in hell I'm doing immigration law. So that mm -hmm. just torpedoed my entire law school plan <laughs> within like two months of practice. I absolutely hated it. So, you know, you just, you just never know. And, and that's why I tell law students, uh, law students are, are very peculiar uh, type of uh, crowd. They're, 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 uh, yeah, they're, they're a particular type of crowd. So, you know, they think they know what they want and they think they know what the legal practice is like. And, you know, and then um, the legal industry will humble you very, very, very fast and very quickly. So I always tell them, keep an open mind, work hard, but there's going to be some shifts in your career. Um, very rarely do you actually do what you set out to do. So with your experience with the um, criminal law, has there been any like super interesting stories or anything that's happened to you where you're kind of just like you were taken aback or anything? Uh, in the criminal world, um, when I was taken back was when I was asked where my attorney was. <laughs> um, oh. That was a big shocker for me because, you know, you got to keep in mind when, when I came out, you know, I'm young. I'm brown. I have a beard. My name is Muhammad Ramadan, right? So mm -hmm. they're used to Bob, John, and Bill, who are 50, 60-year-old white guys that come in. So they're not used to seeing young guys like me, let alone a young brown Muslim guy, right? Mm -hmm. And I didn't change my name to Mike or, you know, whatever. And people suggest that to me. Well, you know, Salam mm -hmm. Muhammad Ramadan, you know, why don't you be Mike or something? No, you know, this is who I am. If they don't like it, well, you know. Who cares? Yeah. Um, so that, that was kind of the, the 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 biggest shock for me when I first came out. Um, the flip side of that was I was a little taken back how much other lawyers helped me. Right. Um, you know, there were some really good attorneys that I looked up to that um, you know I could pick up the phone and say, you know, hey Mike, I, I'm in front of this judge and I got this case. You know, do you have a case I can use or how do you suggest I handle this? So what strategy? And mm -hmm. you know, when I first started, I was learning on my own. Like I had no idea what I was doing. I was just going to a courthouse and just figuring things out. And I remember once um, the judge asked me to, to draft an order for something. And I was like, yeah, judge, no problem. She went on recess. I had no clue what I was doing. <laughs> I had no idea what she wanted. Right. And some older veteran lawyer, he can, he saw the deer in the headlights look and and I'm looking around like, what do I do? You know, and I'm like freaking out. I'm trying to Google it and I'm trying to like figure it out. And, you know, he came and he's like, hey, man, grab this, fill this out, type this, put this, put that. This is what she's asking for. I gave it to the clerk and the judge looked at it. She said, good job, counsel. It's a good order. She signed it. I'm like, thank you, judge. You know, and just kind of walked out and I kind of gave him the little pound as we're leaving. And, you know, I was a little shocked, like, you know. That was really cool. And and uh -huh. in the criminal world, it's us versus them. All the defense attorneys, it's us versus the government. And I didn't expect that. I didn't expect that camaraderie uh, because you and, uh, you know, you, when you're in law school, it's so competitive that when you come out to the real practice, you're expecting that same level of competitiveness where even in my law school, like they were ripping out pages in the library books so people couldn't get them. And I mean, I got <laughs> wow. days in law school of how competitive it was. So when I That's saw that crazy. in practice that they were very helpful and it was really us versus the state, I thought that was really cool. Um, yeah. that, that was the biggest shocker for me. I mean, in my law school, they would just pass around fake outlines. So oh, like yeah. fake notes to <laughs> get people to trip up because it is on a curve system and you want to be the best. And you're always hearing, if I'm not in the top 10% of my class, I'm never going to get a job out of law school. When that's just not the case a lot of the time. I was bottom 20 of my law school class. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I was just, I was, I was literally bottom 20 of my law school class. <laughs> Um, and I just was named super lawyers, which is for the two, top two and a half percent of attorneys in, in Illinois. Okay. So I'm not saying the award to, to brag. My point is yeah. who gives a crap what your GPA is in law school, right? It, it just yeah. it does not matter guys. Like I cannot stress this enough now do good. Okay. I'm not telling you just go bomb law school. Right. Yeah. But my point is if you are a bottom 20 percenter, 
it's okay. It's, it's not the end of the world. I promise you, it is not the end of the world. So, you know, we always had a joke in law school. Uh, the A students become professors, B students become judges, C students become millionaires, right? So that was kind of the running joke in, in law school. But it does not matter, man. I mean, again, do your best. If you get a 4.0, great, right? But if you got a 2.5 and you graduated, well, guess what? Your degree is going to say the exact same thing as the person with the 4.0. So it just doesn't matter in practice. It yeah. really doesn't. I think people need to learn the value of networking and experience over kind of a GPA a little bit. One million percent. Who you that's know is much better than what you know. Yeah, because who's going to get you the jobs? It's the people that you know. Oh, this person recommended your law firm to me. Thank you. Like That's how you, you market your own self, especially if your GPA or your grades aren't there. Then networking becomes even more essential. I honestly, it is going to sound weird when I interview for associates or interns, I don't like 4.0 students. I, I see 4.0. <laughs> I'll tell you what, one, they're know-it-alls, two, they're perfectionists. You cannot be a perfectionist in this industry. And they, they mm-hmm. scare me. They really do because 4.0 in law school means you've always had a 4.0. So how are you going to handle screwing up? You're going to get flustered. You're going to say, oh my God, I messed up. I don't have time for that, right? I, mm-hmm. I need that person that's screwed up a little bit, that knows how to handle when things hit the fan. Because in the legal world, things are never one plus one equals two. So, um, yeah, 4.0 scared me. When I see the resume, I see 4.0. I'm like, <laughs> eh, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll listen to him or her, but eh, I don't know if she's, he or she is at the top of my list. That's just me. I, I, and maybe because I was a 2.5-er and 2.7-er. And I am a little bit more, uh, you know, not so much sympathetic, but I'm a little more biased towards them. Um, but yeah, I don't, I honestly, I, I look, when I hire in the legal world, I look for women. That's my number one. Uh, and, and that's maybe reverse sexism. I don't know if that's a thing. <laughs> uh, my best interns have all been women. All of them. Why? Why do you think so? The chip on their shoulder. They, they know they have to do better than everybody else. Uh, and, and, Mm-hmm. I don't make the rules, uh, but women attorneys, women interns just have this certain fight, this certain hustle, this certain work ethic. It's just unmatched. And, and, and they just come in guns blazing. <laughs> it's just this really this, this, um, this chip on their shoulder. And, and it shows in their work. They're organized. They, they listen. They want to work hard. And, you know, if you work in my office, you got to be a fighter and you got to work hard. And I just found that the women in law school, they just have it all. I, I, you know, again, I don't know if this is reverse, <laughs> but I'm, I'm always open about this. My best interns have all been women, all of them. Because it's, it's such a male saturated field that women feel like we have to, or at least in my class, where there were so many more males than females. And if you didn't fight to speak, you had some, of those gunners in the class or some guys that say their statement as if it's fact, like what they said is law. And it's like, no, that's not how it works. So you have to come in and you have to come in being smarter. You have to come in being tougher. You have to come in being a little louder. Otherwise they'll just brush you under the rug. And most of those gunners are white males. Yeah. And they'll even think they could tell the professors (laughs) what the law is. Like you'd have them just sitting there for 15, 20 minutes, just arguing with the professor about what the law is. Correct. And most of them are white males. Yeah. And I'm like, they I can't wait to, to see you argue with the judge. I can't wait to see that happen. Yeah, it's that whole, yeah, it's just that whole concept of like white privilege, especially with like white males. Because it's, it's, it, this industry has generally been for mm-hmm. white males, right? Mm-hmm. So there, now that it's changing and statistically more women are getting into law, and there's more women, more women applying to law school than men almost now. If it's not even, women are slowly mm-hmm. creeping above mm-hmm. it. And now there's more minorities. There's more women. The legal world is changing. It's no mm-hmm. longer just the old white guy behind a messy desk anymore, right? Mm-hmm. And and that's kind of what I try to pitch, and I and I and I do a lot of um, you know events, and I talk to law student law schools and law students, and you know, and I always tell them. I am who I am. I stick to who I am and I do very well, you know, and, and it's, it has not affected me uh, to that point. Honestly, it's been the other way. People like that I'm younger and, 
and I have big, mm-hmm. my, you know, a biggie mural in my office, right? I have, mm-hmm. you know, I have, I'm a big Banksy fan, right? If you guys are not familiar with Banksy, he's yeah. a big street artist. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm Palestinian. And I've had people come in and say, ah, don't you think it's a little too political? I don't care. It's my office. Mm-hmm. I don't like it. Mm-hmm. There's a million other attorneys. Be my guest. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. you know, it, the legal yeah. world is not for you. I had a question. So I wanted to ask, I feel like a lot of Muslims hesitate going into the law field because they feel like it goes against their Islamic values or that they have to lie. So how do you maintain your Muslim identity as you go through law school without being, you know, feel like, like it's going against your Islamic values? Easy. It's actually the most Islamic thing you can do is defending someone's rights. There's nothing more Islamic than being just, right? Islam is based mm-hmm. on justice. Islam came because if you look at it, God brought it down because, and I'm going to say this, the people of the era were so terrible, right? They were terrible mm-hmm. people. They, they were very unjust. They, they, Islam came and gave rights to people that never had rights. So mm-hmm. if there's nobody there to enforce those rights, what good are those rights to have? You know, so mm-hmm. being an attorney, in my opinion, of course, I'm biased. But it's actually very Islamic. Justice is a cornerstone of Islam. And if you don't have justice, you know, what do you have at that point? So mm-hmm. we, we come after the fact. And one of my friends who's super religious, Michelle, very religious. I'm not uber religious, he, but he is. You know, we've sat down with you, you know, when we were doing criminal defense. And they're like, no, you know, you didn't tell someone to drink and drive. But there's rights in this country. And you are just there defending their rights. Now, after their rights are exhausted and the court still finds them guilty, well, then so be it. But us fighting for your rights that are there for you, in my opinion, mm-hmm. is extremely Islamic. It's a cornerstone of Islam. And I, I, nobody can tell me different. So how do you, um, when you find yourselves in a group of like, you know, a bunch of white guys, older 50, 60 lawyers, when you're working with colleagues or peers and you're going back and forth, How do you find yourself like leveled in comparison? Like not how you, obviously you don't see yourself inferior to them, but do you ever feel like in your field, people do sometimes look at you and they kind of just, you know, wipe you like, I don't know. They don't take you maybe as seriously or they don't see you as competitive or anything of that nature. Yeah. um, You know, there was more of that when I first started um, Mm -hmm. than it is now. I mean, now I'm just, you know, I'm not well-established, you know, Um, I kind of have my reputation and I have my client base. So now, you know, but I've always been confident in myself, right? And in this industry, if you're not confident in yourself, it will eat you up and spit you out. So again, I always knew who I was, right? I'm Mm -hmm. a brown Muslim guy with a name that's Muhammad Ramadan. And it never bothered me. And and I was proud of it. And I, for me, it's, it's, it was, I'm a walking banner for our community. So as an attorney, mm-hmm. by having the name of Muhammad Ramadan, whether I liked it or not, I'm a walking banner for our community. So for me, it was always make sure you do your best. Make sure you always dress the best. Make sure you always speak properly and do things the right way because whether you want to be a representation of Islam or not, you are a representation of your community. So mm-hmm. for, for some, that scares them. For me, it was a sense of pride. Because keep in mind, I went into law school to become an attorney so that kid that grew up where I grew up couldn't say what I said, that I never grew up with attorneys that look like me and talk like me and grew up like me, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the person we we spoke about earlier, uh, when I graduated, it was one of the greatest moments of my life because he came up to me and he shook my hand and said, thank you. And I said, you know, thank you for what? And he said, every excuse my son ever had of not wanting to go to law school or medical school, because you grew up worse than he will ever have it. And you made it. And that meant so much to me because that was part Mm -hmm. of the reason I wanted to go to law school was so Mm -hmm. that other kids, uh, men and women that looked and like me from our community um, can say, hey, man, he made it. You know what? I can do it. So that's kind of why I like to tell my story and I like to be out in the community because I want them to know that, hey, it's okay to be who you are. Use it as a positive. It's not a negative. I, I'm a big believer of anything that's perceived to be a negative. Flip it, repackage it, and, and turn it into a positive. And, and that's kind of, that's how I became successful in my law firm was the biggest negative I had was I was young. 
right? I was young, mm -hmm. I was a minority, and I kept thinking to myself, well, you know, I'm young, I don't have a ton of money, I don't have a reputation, I don't have a fancy name, you know, all these negatives. And then it hit me one day, how do I flip these negatives to a positive? And then I came to a point, I said, you know what? I'm going to be the new, young, cool lawyer. That's, that was what I wanted to do. So what did mm -hmm. I do? I went on social media. It was free. It was still kind of before Facebook became the garbage that it is now. <laughs> but, you know, this was five years ago. Lawyers were telling me five years ago, Mo, you're insane. What are you doing? That's unprofessional. Why would you go on social media? And I promise you, those same attorneys are now calling me. Hey, Mo, I put a post up. I haven't got clients yet. How do you do Facebook? <laughs> How do you do Instagram, mm -hmm. right? I flipped it and I said, you know what? I am young. I am cool. I am, you know, different. Well, guess what? I'm going to sell that now. So don't let your negatives, uh, don't, the negatives don't stay a negative. It's up to you what you do with it. So sell it. I mean, sell mm -hmm. your negatives. And that's what I always tell people, especially, you know, minorities and, and, and Muslims. So sell your negative. And, and that's what I did. And I built myself and that's, you know, clients like me for that, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of my long-term clients, they'll come to the office. Sometimes I'm in jeans, Jordans, and a hoodie. That's who I am. And they're perfectly fine with it because they know mm -hmm. that's me and I'm real. Um, so, uh, you know, I always tell people, people will smell phony a mile away. If you're trying to be something you're not, I promise you, people are not dumb. They'll see it. So mm -hmm. stay true to yourself. I promise you the right people will come to you. I also feel like you bring a sort of transparency to the law because a lot of people are afraid of going to lawyers or they think they're going to get stuffy people that shout a bunch of terms at them that they don't understand and just sign the bottom line at the end. But you bring a lot of transparency to your clients. They see you as a human who went through this process, who understands these convoluted terms that brings it to them simply. You make it more like relatable. Yeah. And, and that's the benefit of social media, right? In today's market, People have so much access through Google, through social media, through so many, so many avenues that they will know who you are before they step foot in your office. Mm -hmm. okay? So mm -hmm. people now, consumers, they want to know who you are. There's no more of this facade. Like people don't want that facade anymore. Honestly, I can tell you, like I can attest we're the first ones that can appreciate what you're saying because I mean, all the hosts or all the co-hosts on our show where he did so automatically as soon as we step into a room there's like a million different things that people are thinking they already have an image of who you are what your personality is going to be like so we i feel like we always at least i can say personally you always have to ensure that your true personality is pushing through so we go out of our way to show people no this is what my personality is yes i wear hijab yes i'm muslim and obviously we're proud you know we're um wearing a badge of islam basically every day and it is, you're right, it does take time to kind of push your true identity on people and get them to understand that, you know, all these things that you have in your head, all these ideas that you thought you knew, it's the reality of it is like 0.5% of what you actually think. And it just caters to people so differently when you tell them like, this is who I am, I'm normal just like you, this is what I can do, this is what I can do. So. Yeah, and, and you guys, you know, to your credit, you, you know, you guys haven't, much harder than a, a guy like me would, right? You know, yeah, I have a beard. You know, my name is Muhammad Ramadan. But, you know, if they don't know my name, you know, they might say, eh, he could be something else. When you're a hijabi, there's no denying who you are, right? So, mm -hmm. and I know this becomes an issue because I know friends who are lawyers who wear the hijab, they have to consider things that I do not, right? So mm -hmm. when they're doing a jury trial, in the back of their minds, they have to wonder, are they going to rule against my client because they don't like a hijabi, right? Mm -hmm. I don't have that issue. You know, so we have to be fair where, yeah, we can relate, but a hijabi woman is, is, has a much different situation. I have to be fair to them. They mm -hmm. have a much harder situation than I will ever have. Have I faced mm -hmm. those hurdles? Absolutely. But I'm also still mm -hmm. a guy. Okay, so yeah. I have some privilege there. You know, mm -hmm. I don't wear hijab. I have some privilege there. So I say that to say I give you guys a lot more credit because you wear it every day. I can mm -hmm. hide from it. I can shave my beard. You know, I can call myself Mike. I can say I'm Puerto Rican, right? You know, so like, <laughs> I, I can do those things. You guys can't. So you guys wear the badge every day. 
and you guys face things that a Muslim man will never ever face. So mm -hmm. uh, we have some of the same things. We're not the same. Uh, you guys deserve yeah. it. Honestly, going oh, through the back you. of my head, definitely when you're going into court was, oh, is this jury going to hate me on site automatically? Are there going to be prejudices that I have to go through before even making up my point? And it's actually funny. I have a story, <laughs> um, not in jury because I haven't been in trial yet, but my professor for legal writing, she, it's funny because she was actually an immigration lawyer. So the fact that she kind of was ignorant was ironic but anyway so i was in the class and we turned in this like 25 page memo or brief right or a motion whatever it was a, a document and it's 25 pages and i had like three spelling mistakes in this whole document and she comes to me after and this is a rough draft it's not even like the final one but three spelling mistakes and she comes to me after class and she says oh, maybe you have these grammar mistakes. How long have you been in the country? It's okay. I'll give you a good grade on it, any, regardless of these mistakes. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it's really hard to spell. <laughs> Just so she can give me the A. So I used her ignorance to my benefit. But she automatically assumed I was an immigrant student or an LLM student just for the mere fact that I had hijab in the class and I had three spelling mistakes in this huge document. And it was funny. I was like, I just want to see everybody else's spelling mistakes in the class. <laughs> Look, it happens. And, you know, it, even though when I say the legal world is changing, it's still, we are the slowest mm -hmm. industry to change by far. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's my biggest issue with the law. Um, you know, again, you know, when I started doing uh, marketing, you know, I, I'll never forget. I did my first video. I had Kanye West in the background, right? I'm a <laughs> West fan. I'm a Chicago guy. And I, I did this whole video and, you know, I rented like an Uber black and I, I had, you know, this whole <laughs> setup, you know, I, I, like I did the whole thing. I'm a hip hop kid, right? I'm a 90, you know, yeah. a 90s kid. And yeah. I will never forget how many lawyers were talking crap about me. And mm -hmm. it didn't phase me because I had 55,000 views in a week. Wow. Right? Wow. And I told them, Hey, you can say, Oh, you want homie? I got 55,000 views. So people must like something. Right. Mm -hmm. My point of that story and why I tell law students that is I was true to myself. And yes, there's people going to talk and people still talk about me, but I'm OK. Trust me, I'm, I'm doing perfectly fine. So mm -hmm. you're going to get that. And the best way to overcome that is just kick ass in the legal world and your reputation will speak for itself. It is somewhat. A, I, I, I will say this hesitantly. But it, I will say it's a meritocracy in the legal world in the sense that if you do great legal work, people will recognize it. OK, so mm -hmm. if you're just a good, great attorney after a while, that stuff's not going to matter. I mean, they, they're not going to care because then the day the client wants their job done. And if they know you're the person that can get it done, they're not going to mm -hmm. care what you wear, what your name is, who you look like. They want you to get it done. Yeah, definitely. Um, Muhammad, what's one thing you wish you would have known prior to? getting involved in, with law? Like what's something you wish somebody would have told you before you pursued law? That's a good question. Um, a very good question. I, two things. One, mm -hmm. I kind of knew, but now even more so, uh, mentorship is the most important thing for your entire career. Nothing mm -hmm. will ever trump mentorship. You find you a good mentor, um, they will be the backbone of your career. I just last week, I've been out of law school, say, 10 years now. I emailed my, my mentor. She was my contracts professor. Uh, I loved her to death. And back to your earlier point about GPA, she was my worst grade in law school. We always joke about it. <laughs> she was my professor. She was my mentor. She taught me so much about the stuff that I do in business now. And I always tell them, like, you know, and I'm like, you know, you gave me a C minus, right? <laughs> okay, so just show you why grades don't matter. She's like, well, you were one of my best students. I'm like, I just, I guess maybe I'm a crappy test taker. But <laughs> 10 years later, I still emailed her some questions that I had about a huge client that I have right now. Okay, so just to show you, um, which leads to my second point. You're always learning. Always, always, always. And it sounds simple. But your first couple of years, you're going to believe that. And then you just start to feel yourself a little bit like, okay, now I'm really a lawyer. You know, first year you're scared. You don't know what the hell you're doing. 
Second year, you're, you're kind of catching, you know, a little wind in your sails. Third year, you know, you did a couple good jobs. You might have won a case. You're feeling yourself now. You're like, okay, you know, I'm a <laughs> lawyer now, blah, blah, blah. And it, it took for a veteran attorney who's one of the, the greatest attorneys Chicago's ever had, no joke. Um, and I, I'll never forget it. We, we were just talking in court and, and, you know, I was about four years out and I, again, I won a few cases. I was, I was kind of feeling myself and, and I was telling him how I won this case. And he's like, Oh, you know, what case did you use? And he's asking me for advice. And, and I'm like, John, I'm like, you're asking me. I'm like, do you know who you are? You know, I'm joking with him. I'm like, you're it. He's like, yeah, I'm always learning. What did you do? Maybe I could use that in my next case. And he's wow. he looked at me. He's like, you're always learning. It's like, don't stop learning. Like, the moment you stop learning is the moment you better retire from the law game. Okay. So now I learn from everything, you know, and, and I learned how to learn. And it sounds really weird, but mm -hmm. I learned the skill of learning. And that's why I was able to transition to another area of law after five years that I would never have been able to do after two years because I know how to learn now. I, I can learn faster. I know how to kind of mm -hmm. research and, and do that. So you're always, always, always learning. If you're not continually learning and, and trying to hone your craft, you might as well retire. You know, so I think I would tell my young self, stay humble and always, always continue to learn. There's always something to learn. And it sounds very simple, but when you're so knee deep into your career and you're so sick of school, <laughs> you know, you forget that you still need to, to continue to learn and and it's not always from lawyers, you know, like mm -hmm. I look at um, business guys to, for tips on how to, you know, better my law office, right? Uh, COVID, COVID changed my entire law office. And mm -hmm. it really allowed me and made me, forced me to look at my, my law practice and see where my holes were. And it exposed me. But I was honest with myself, right? I, 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 mm -hmm. I enabled myself to be honest and say, yeah, you know, I built a, a very good law firm, but I can always do better. And COVID really exposed some things. And I changed a lot of things in my office in the last three to four months because COVID exposed, you know, at, at least for me, it exposed a lot of uh, weaknesses. So that's continually, you know, learning. So mm -hmm. I learned from music artists. I, I learned from business people. I learned from, uh, no, I won't say politicians. We don't learn anything from that. <laughs> <laughs> You can learn, I, I learn from clients, <laughs> you know, I, I, I've learned from clients, you know, and, and uh -huh. you're always learning, man. You're just, if you're, if you don't, if you stop learning, stop doing whatever you're doing right there. Honestly, that's such good advice coming out of law school. Cause I feel like when I went to my first externship, when I went for my first law clerk job, you always feel so like uneducated. Like I didn't learn any of this in law school or when they ask you for something, you always have that self doubt. Why, why don't I know this already? How come I don't already know this? Why can't I give them an answer right away? So you always have that negative self talk and it's good to know that you'll never feel like you'll learn enough and you shouldn't feel like you learn enough. You should always try and continue to grow and be better. I think that was one of my biggest challenges in my first law clerk job is your, not your having greatest skill as a, your greatest skills an attorney is going to be your research and analytical skills. Right. Yeah. It, it, you're never going to know everything. Um, so it's, it's how to how to research something and figure it out. So like when I have interns, I throw them with the wolves. I don't hold their <laughs> hand. Right. I give them the thing and they'll say, you know, this, I don't know. Figure it out. Come back to me an hour. I'm busy. Right. And I'm not doing that to be mean. I'm doing that to say, oh, when you're an attorney, you got to figure it out. That's mm -hmm. the whole point of being an attorney. They're paying you to figure it out. So start learning to figure it out. No, you don't know the answer, right? That's why you have all the tools. Grab your tools, figure it out. And if you're wrong, I'll tell you at the end you're wrong. But I make them suffer until I give them an answer. <laughs> I, I, I make them suffer and agonize over it. But that's, that's being an attorney, right? You're not always going to have the answer. Sometimes you just got to make crap up and, and, <laughs> and throw it out there and see if it sticks. Sometimes you have a crappy case, right? Like you just have to throw it and see if it works. That's being an attorney. Like, you know, I'll tell you the problem. It's TV. TV has ruined the image of attorneys, right? <laughs> uh, all these shows, these movies. It's like, you know, one scene they sign the client, the next scene they're talking to them in jail, the next scene they're in front of a jury. 
that's a three year process. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's 80 yeah. hours of discovery review and, and research and prepping. And, you know, it's like TV made these mm-hmm. people come out of law school think, well, why aren't we going to trial? What do you mean? You haven't even gone to discovery yet. Well, what's discovery? This is not suits, you know, like <laughs> in the real world, right? My you know, mom watched suits. There's no Harvey walking in the that. room, right? That guy doesn't exist, <laughs> right? There's no Harvey in, in the real world, okay? So TV has really kind of ruined that in a sense. Um, and, I, you know, I love a good law drama. I, I hate yeah. to uh, my wife knows not to watch him in front of me because, <laughs> yeah, I know, babe, I just got a quick question. No, <laughs> real, don't ask me, okay? <laughs> That's not how it works. But I know you don't just object in the air and yell at the judge. and Absolutely <laughs> not, you know? So that's why when I have interns, I, I throw them to the wolves. And the reason is you need to learn how to figure stuff out. And that can apply for all professions. It's not just the legal world. Yeah. You need to learn how to figure things out. Honestly, um, majority of the reason we even started our podcast, besides the fact that we wanted to, you know, have our own identity and be able to speak for ourselves as um, young Muslim women professionals is so that we can learn from people. Like we love having guests. We love having you with us, with your rawness and your honesty and your transparency, like Mariam had mentioned, because I mean, we're always looking for mentors. We're always looking for people to help to guide us. You know, we're still up and coming in our professions. We're still in school. We're still learning. We're graduating. So that's why it's even so much better that you're in our community. Like you're from the South suburbs of Chicago. You're practicing in our own backyard. So it's so great to know that we have mentors like you that we can turn to that you're very casual. You're very open. You're very honest. And you're just looking to benefit other people. So, I mean, this is one of the reasons that we asked you to come on the show also so that our listeners know, hey, if you're interested in law, if you want to pursue law, we have people like Muhammad Ramadan in the community that could be a great mentor that would be more than willing to open that door for you. So it's pretty cool. And the caveat of that, and and I always tell people this is, this is how I am, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. But if you want to be in the corporate legal world, that's okay too, right? Like if you want to be Mm -hmm. professional all the time, that's perfectly fine. Like you're not being fake. You're not being phony. That's who you are, right? Like mm-hmm. you don't have to be like me to be real, right? And, and that's what mm-hmm. I want people to know. But what I want people to know is figure out who you are and you have to be real with yourself first. Mm-hmm. You have to know who you are. And, and I know who I am and I knew how I grew up and I know the kind of environment I grew up and I, and I want to portray that image so people that did grow up like me understand that I don't have to change to become successful. But if you want to be uber professional, wear a three piece suit as an attorney, great, do that, right? Like Mm -hmm. I'm not saying to always follow my path. What Mm -hmm. I do want people to know is stick to who you are, but you need to find out who you are first. And in order to Mm -hmm. do that, you need to be real with yourself. And and the reason I, I say that is with today's world, man, and it's just, there, everything's a copycat image. Everything is, is you know, with social media, everything is, is filtered and this. And it's just like, no, you know, that's not how the real world is. It's okay to screw up. Like, it's okay to not know everything. It's okay to not have your life set at 35. You know, like, it's okay. And I just think that we're always taught now that, especially, you know, our culture is, can be very tough on us, right? Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, go out there and, you know, I, I've met to so many kids that say, man, I, I, I want to I wanna work for a nonprofit. I really want to do this. But but my mom and dad say, Shumalik, you want to make 40 grand a year. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, you yeah, know definitely. You, you oh, know definitely. That, right? yeah. You know, it's like I, I've had kids and it's so true. But what do you mean you're going to work for free? If you have internship, well, just going to be you know, it's like, well, yeah, I got to get my foot in the door. I don't be bit You know, like, they don't understand that concept of internship uh-huh. can lead to other other doors. So we also have to fight cultural uh, idiosyncrasies, as I call them. You know, and, and we have to fight there because I don't know if you guys are, I'm first generation. I'm sure you guys are either first generation or second generation. You know it's different. Our parents didn't grow up here, right? Like, I didn't know how to apply for an LSAT. My mom and dad didn't know. You know, they pushed me for school. God bless them. They they were all for it. But my mom didn't know what the hell an LSAT was. She didn't uh-huh. know how to apply for financial aid. Like, I just fended for myself. 
So I don't mm-hmm. want kids now to, to, to not have that because I didn't have that. I didn't have attorneys mm-hmm. that I, that I can go to, you know, and, and I think now our generation of attorneys, um, we're much tighter knit. Uh, you know, we started a Facebook group, a private one. And the reason we started is, you know, we came to the conclusion, no work should leave our community. We have enough attorneys in our community that mm-hmm. not a single referral should ever leave the Arab community. And now we refer to each other. You know, we'll go on to, hey, I got this client. Does anybody handle this? Oh, you do great. Here, take it, right? Hey, I got this situation. This is going on in court. It, it was tremendous. We have a WhatsApp group for COVID. Hey, guys, do you have the COVID link for this courtroom? Do you have the code? We help each other out, you know? And people always, and I've had people ask me, you know, Mo, don't you think you mentor too much? Don't you think you give too much advice? Aren't you worried they're going to be your competition? I wish you're my competition, right? One, I'm comfortable mm-hmm. in my own skin. I'm good. I'm okay. I'm not worried about competition. But I want the young Arab kid, you know, when I've had kids say, man, I want to be like you. No, you don't. You want to be better than me. Because mm-hmm. the greater we all look, the greater we all are going to be, right? Why do people these days say, oh, I want a Jewish lawyer? Not all Jewish lawyers are great. But as a community, they built this perception that Jewish lawyers are great. So if we build each other up as attorneys to all be very good, I always tell people our goal should be in 10 years, I want people screaming, man, I want an Arab lawyer, right? Like that, that's <laughs> what I want people to say. So by helping the younger attorneys become great attorneys, it's gonna make us all better. And, and maybe I'm just an ideal idealist. Uh, maybe I'm just corny, I don't know, <laughs> you know, I don't know what it is, but I, I truly believe it. And, and, I'm just comfortable in my own skin. I always tell attorneys that ask me that. That means you're scared. And if you're scared, that's your problem, Habibi. That's not my problem. I'm, I'm comfortable in my skin. So uh, I, I'm okay with it. And I, I just, I really believe in, in, in advancing our community. It's just, it benefits everyone. Honestly, that's amazing. And that's something that we should apply to all professions, not just law. Whether it's the medical field or the dental field or social work, whatever it may be. I mean, there is more than enough Muslims, especially coming from the south suburbs of Chicago, Muslims, Arab. We're such a big community that there's literally no reason to look outside of the community for help, like you had said. But I wanted to kind of ask you more of what made you want to do a podcast? So you're in the moment, um, the pun on your name, that's an up and coming, you know, you just started the podcast, I think a few months ago. So what made you want to do a podcast? How'd you come upon that? Um, it's a good question. First, I wanted to give us our own platform. I don't think we have Mm -hmm. enough of our own platforms. And the only way we're going to get our points across, I I don't like relying on other people outside of our community because we're never going to get a fair shake. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I I believe in creating Mm -hmm. our own platforms and that's why Mm -hmm. you guys are doing and and why I follow you guys. Um, you. you know, secondly, I, I like podcasts, right? And I would search, and I'm a big Spotify guy. All legal podcasts were so boring. They were <laughs> so freaking boring. And I would try to find a good one. It's just like, okay, dude, you know, like, we get it. And lawyers are generally boring people. I'm sorry, but like, really dry people. And, and the reason is, law schools teach you not to have character. And it blows my mind. Like they really uh-huh. want you to be a robot. Like hide yeah. your character. Don't be a, screw that, dude. Why? Show your character. People want to see it. And I also noticed all the legal podcasts were geared towards attorneys. And I don't, uh, you know, attorneys don't really want to hear other attorneys talk. Like we have attorney friends. So if I want to mm-hmm. know about attorney stuff, I'll pick up the phone and call up another attorney or one of our mm-hmm. group or what what's that group. So it's like, dude, I, you know. We're tired of, it's like, it, it felt so like egotistical, like we want to talk to ourselves and hear ourselves talk. <laughs> let me bring in another attorney and let's pat our <laughs> in the back. And I'm like, well, what about the people who are not attorneys? Like they want information too. Yeah. So I, I, I felt there was a need for a podcast that other non-attorneys can relate to. So mm-hmm. I try to bring in other attorneys to come on who are very smart and me as the host, I feel like not to dumb it down. Yeah. Dumb it down from the legal perspective. 
Mm-hmm. And the biggest compliment I've I've gotten so far, and we've been doing it almost oh it's almost been about to be a year now. Uh now that wow. coming up. Um, is that I ask questions that the listeners feel that they, they want to know. Mm-hmm. And I'm so happy about that because mm-hmm. it's what I wanted, right? I this is for, mm-hmm. for other people. And the more I do it, the more I love it. Like I really enjoy doing the podcast. Um, and then it kind of expanded from there, right? At first it was just lawyers, but then I had Ahmed Rehab on. Honestly, yeah. so refreshing your niche of podcasting because people don't realize that law is in every single part of society. Like regardless of whether you want to be in it or not, it's in your life. And you need to understand how it plays a factor. People don't know what politicians are doing behind the scenes. People don't know how laws that are played in in courtrooms or that are played in on the political like arena, how that can affect your life majorly. And it's really refreshing to see that you're taking it and you're breaking it down so that you don't need a law school education to understand the law. You shouldn't need a law school education to understand the law because Mm -hmm. it affects every single part of your day. Yeah, people that don't like lawyers hate when I say this, but there's no civil rights movement without the attorneys in the background drafting up these laws for people to pass, right? Yeah. There's Mm -hmm. no civil rights movement. If there's no lawyers fighting those cases to the Supreme Court. Okay. Mm-hmm. You know, our, our, our movement as Muslims and, and, you know, I'm, I'm a nationalist. I, I, I readily admit that I'm a pro Palestinian nationalist. So that's my cause. Right. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, my professor in law school, she defended Palestinian detainees in Israeli jails. Right. Mm-hmm. She, a white lady from Michigan, Wow, white lady from Michigan. Right. Mm-hmm. And now She's out here. She's the foremost expert in abolishing the capital punishment, which is the death sentence. Mm-hmm. And she saved so many lives. Now, she won't admit that because she's just a very humble person. But lawyers did that. Lawyers are saving people from bad DNA testing. And what I always say, we are the last stop from the government taking something that nobody else can give you, your liberty. Right. Mm -hmm. I represent business clients. They could lose a business, but they can get another business. Right. You know, you get an injury case. God forbid, unless you die, you'll survive. Mm -hmm. But your liberty, your liberty and the government taking your liberty is the most important thing a person can have. And who is the last person that's going to protect you from getting your liberty taken away? They're lawyers. Now, is there scumbag attorneys out there? Absolutely. Okay, there's plenty of them. But that should not take away from all the really great attorneys. And this country and society is just built on laws. So, I mean, you know, I want people to be educated on those laws because it dictates everything that we do. I mean, you walk across the street, there's laws, <laughs> you know, like the way you drive, the way you dress. I mean, look, they're trying to regulate, you know, the headscarf in some areas, right? Like, mm-hmm. you know, everything is regulated by law. So, you know, an educated republic is a great republic. So I'm not saying I'm going to educate the whole country, but if I can be a small piece of that within the legal world, and I wish more lawyers would do that. Uh, but there's this like thing against giving free advice with lawyers because they always want to bottom out their dollar. Right? <laughs> and it's annoying because it is a noble profession, contrary to what some might say about <laughs> us. We don't generally rank really high. I mean, I think we're just above these car salesmen and politicians. <laughs> too far above them in, in uh, likability rankings. So the reason I do a lot of these things is I always say I'm ambitious. I want to change the way people look at attorneys. I really do. Mm-hmm. I want to bring that, you know, before people wanted to be attorneys, right? They, they wanted to be Clarence Thomas. They wanted to be these people. Now it's like, oh, you're an attorney? You know, like, you know it's like you got cooties and stuff like that. Someone said I wasted my potential by being an attorney. Isn't that always nice to hear? (laughs) You're going to get those comments, right? Uh, You're going to hear the same lawyer jokes, all right? And and I love a good lawyer joke, but some of them are just really dumb, all right? Like, it better be funny, okay? Like, I I love a good lawyer joke, but a lot of them are, like, really dumb. But but I I really – I'm really on a crusade to change the way lawyers are perceived because I think we have a bad reputation. And a lot of that is on us. Because yeah. we're dry, because we're taught not to show character, because we want to bottom out and don't give free advice. We don't want to do community work. We don't want to be out there doing stuff for the community. 
Well, of course people are going to think you're selfish and you're greedy and you don't care about them because you don't, <laughs> you know, like mm-hmm. it's, it's the truth. So we have to break that perception. And that's why I try to talk to law students and say, look, it's okay to make money, right? We all want to make money. And I'm mm-hmm. not against that. We make money here. Trust me, we're a business. But I take time to do um, other things that don't involve money. Um, so, you know, my suggestion to young future attorneys, you know, they ask me, well, you know, how do I balance my time? Pick your one cause. Pick your two causes, right? You can't be everywhere. You can't help every organization. Learn to say no, okay? Learn to say no. And, and pick your lane. You know, I, I work with E-Man. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Rami and Shishin. Yeah. Uh-huh. I grew up with E-Man. I grew up with Rami. Like, Rami mm-hmm. really guided me. That's my number one group. I, I do work for them all the time. I've never billed them a dollar. I do work for E-Man. Other groups, I'm busy or I can't help you or because I give my energy to the one or two groups that I do. Let another mm-hmm. attorney deal with those other groups. So, you know, we have to change our perception, but it, 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 it falls on us. Mm-hmm. Said, we can't wait to see you be successful in your crusade and hopefully be a part of it as well. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we've had a great experience having you on our show. I hope everybody that tuning in and listening is having as much fun listening to this episode as we've had recording, honestly. Um, and Muhammad, your transparency and your honesty is not something that you come across very often, especially in the law field. And the fact that you're working so hard to change that is great. It's inspiring. And we hope that you can continue on your crusade and you're successful and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up doors for you and your podcast. Doors you didn't even imagine you can open and you're successful in all that you do. And you continue to work hard to uplift yourself, your career, and our community. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank and you thank you to. Oh, and thank you. No, no, thank you. <laughs> um, I know that you can find Muhammad's podcast in the moment. So make sure that you definitely search it up. You find it. You tune in. I've listened to an episode. It's a great show for someone that knows nothing about law. It made a lot of sense to me. Um, I believe you're also on Facebook. Um, do you have other social media handles people can follow? Yeah, I'm a Facebook, Instagram guy. Um, I know a lot of you guys are going to uh, follow me on LinkedIn. I hate LinkedIn, okay? <laughs> For some reason, every time I talk to law students, my LinkedIn <laughs> emails blow up. And I just never really got into LinkedIn. So I might accept you, but I'm not on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, Facebook, Instagram, um, Attorneys of Chicago on Instagram. I'm a big fan of Instagram. I hate Twitter. Twitter's the the, the worst. Team. Uh, so don't, you know, if you see me on Twitter, it's my marketing team. I'm not going to lie to you. It's not me. So if you, I don't know, you guys DM or at or whatever you do on Twitter. I'm not yeah. gonna on, uh, Facebook, I'm active on Facebook. Um, Hamad Ramadan or um, Ramadan Associates. And Instagram is Attorneys of Chicago. You can find me on Instagram. I'm pretty active on Instagram. That's my favorite. Sounds good. Um, If at any point you've listened to this episode and you liked it, don't forget to give our video a thumbs up. If you haven't already, make sure you just subscribe to our YouTube channel so you're notified every time we drop a new episode. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at The Modern Skeps. If you ever have any new episode ideas you'd like us to discuss, feel free to email us at themodernskeps at gmail.com. Sincerely, The Modern Skeptics. P.S. Always remember to be true to yourself.